Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. We have 40, 41 participants, possibly more coming in. I'm Cheryl Van Dallensmith, Associate Dean Academic with the Faculty of Grad Studies. And we're so thrilled to be talking to you from the perspective of alumni and scholars who have lived your dream of going to graduate school here at York University. We really hope that you're going to choose Grad York. And we have some panelists who are going to answer some questions that have come in from many of you uh, so that you can get a sense. So with that, I'd like to welcome in um, our three panelists, if that's okay. I'll welcome in Ramesh, Venkat, Teresa Perimal, and uh, Ariella Marcus, and Alexandro Balassis. And um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us just a little bit about themselves. So we'll start, please, with Ramesh, if that's okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Ramesh, Ramesh Vengitesa Perimal. As you know, uh, from my name and from my accent, I am an internationally educated nurse. I came into this country a few years ago. I recently completed uh, my doctoral degree in nursing, and thanks to all my wonderful professors, including Cheryl, for enabling me to complete uh, the, the doctoral degree. And uh, I am an alumni of uh, York University School of Nursing because I also did my uh, undergraduate degree at uh, York. Maybe I'll tell you a little bit about uh, that later on. And I'm privileged to be a faculty at uh, the School of Nursing. I'm an assistant professor currently teaching at the School of Nursing, York University. I'm very, very happy to be here to be meeting everyone virtually. Thank you, Cheryl, again for the opportunity. Thank you, Thank you Ramesh. How about you, Alex? Why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, all. Uh, I also want to thank you for this great opportunity to talk about uh, grad school, York. So I'm Alexandros Balassis. I am a second year international PhD student studying history here at York University, history department. Uh, I completed my undergraduate studies in history at uh, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece, uh, where I also earned a master's degree there in history. And I also hold a second master's degree from York University, focusing on uh, Greek post-Second World War uh, migration to Canada. My current research interests uh, center around the uh, Greek migration to Canada and Australia after the mm -hmm. Second World War. And more broadly, uh, transoceanic migration, focusing on migrant agency and uh, interaction with uh, uh, migration policies. Wonderful. And how about you, Ariella? Why don't you introduce yourself? So I'm Ariella Marcus, and I am also privileged to be here and to be able to speak on behalf of the Graduate Studies Program. Uh, last year, I graduated, well, actually this year, I graduated from interdisciplinary studies at York, where I did a combination of education, religion, and gender feminist studies, and I was studying pedagogy and prayer in Jewish day schools. I also went to York for my undergrad, where I did children's studies and also a BD in education, primary junior. Wonderful. So you can see, guests, that we have three scholars here, uh, one very recently finished, one finished maybe a year and a half ago, I'm losing track, Ramesh, and one in the program. Two are international, one is domestic, and from three very different programs. So let's, what we're going to do is we have some prepared questions and some prepared responses. And um, if there's questions popping up into the Q&A box, uh, my moderator, Anessa, will uh, let me know if we need to stop and take, uh, take a look at those. But we will have time at the end as well. So let's go with what inspired your decision to pursue a master's or a doctoral degree. Let's start with Ariella. So I'm a teacher and I've been teaching informally at Sunday schools and after school programs since I was in high school. And I've also been teaching full time formally since 2015. Now, my, I, as I mentioned, pedagogy and prayer in Jewish day schools. So the thing that inspired me is when I was teaching, um, it actually came from a question and a discussion that I had with my students. So one of my students, I was teaching in a Jewish day school and prayer is part of the curriculum. So every day we would learn about prayer and we would pray for a little bit. And one of my students asked me, why do you always choose a boy and a girl to lead the prayers every day? Why don't you just choose a boy? But the interesting thing was that this student was actually a girl. So it made me question 
what my students, it made me have so many questions about what my students were learning about gender, what gender teaches them about prayer and what that teaches them. Okay, fantastic. Or have we froze? Maybe we froze a little bit. You realize that about this, I wanted to study and I wanted to, I wanted to bring that aspect of myself to my studies. Okay. Thanks, Ariella. Alex, how about you? What inspired your decision to pursue your, well, you did a master's degree already here and now you're with us again for a doctoral degree. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. So um, I have always had a uh, passion for history. And uh, as I approached graduation, I felt that there was still so much more to learn. And uh, in 2019, uh, because of an undergraduate international exchange program, uh, I came I came to York oh. and uh, I was uh, exposed for the first time in Toronto's uh, diverse and vibrant uh, migrant communities. Uh, so um, with the Greeks being part of this mosaic, a history professor here at York, my current supervisor, Sakis Gekas, uh, introduced me to an uh, to the Immigrant Oral History Archive, which hosts more than 400 interviews uh, of Greek migrants here in Canada, uh, and reapproaches Greek migration to Canada during the 1950s and 1960s through migrants' own voices. Uh, so, after this exposure, I was sure that I wanted to continue my studies in history, and I applied for a master's degree uh, here at York. Uh, throughout my master's studies, I, my research uh, interests became more focused, uh, however, uh, even though I completed my master's degree, I found myself uh, having grumbling with uh, more unanswered questions about Greek mm -hmm. diaspora. So uh, having already worked with my supervisor, I realized that uh, pursuing a PhD was the natural next step uh, in my academic journey. And uh, uh, having in mind that I, I really wanted to, to learn more and uh, continue my studies. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that people often think going to grad school means you'll come with, out with a lot of answers. And, and grad school often means you come out with way more questions, bigger questions, wider questions. So for us, our guests here, if you're curious and you like to think about things and wonder about things, grad school is a good place to do that. So um, Arielle, I'm going to start with you with this question. How did your undergrad degree prepare you for grad school and the program that you took? In my undergrad, I studied Children's Studies at York, which is now renamed Children, Childhood and Youth Studies. So we studied about the United Convention on the Rights of the Child, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. But it wasn't just about children. It was also sort of a crash course in many marginalized groups and how they connect to each other and how we relate to them. And then in addition to that, I was also studying education. In the primary junior division, I was getting my OCT certification. And then in addition to that, I knew that I also wanted to teach in Hebrew and I wanted to teach Judaic studies. So I was doing um, an advanced certificate of Judaic studies at the same time. And York was really the only school that offered all of those things that I could take in conjunction with each other. So it really let me have the background that I needed to go into my master's degree especially with the interdisciplinary studies program, I had to have three separate programs that I was combining to make something unique. So I found that I did have the background because of the undergrad that I did at York. Yeah, okay, thank you. How about you, Ramesh? Thank you, Cheryl. My story is a little bit different. Uh, when I came into this country, I came in with uh, an undergraduate degree and a graduate degree, a Master of Science in Nursing. But uh, when I went to the regulatory body, it was a different story. Me and my wife applied to this regulatory body. My wife comes with, with an undergraduate degree. I come in with uh, a graduate degree, Master of Science in Nursing. They said, no, she's okay to go ahead and get the registration exam done, but you have to have additional uh, education. So you need to go and pursue additional bridging program courses. So then I, I was looking around, I found an undergraduate program that was there for internationally educated nurses. And this is the only program that awards a degree, a bachelor's degree in the country. Uh, uh, so I decided to pursue my undergraduate degree at York University. And I was so, so unhappy at the time when I started with the program. And I said, no, I've already completed my master's. And why are you asking me to go again, do my undergraduate degree? But when I went in, 
it was a blessing in disguise because I had the wonderful opportunity to meet with all the professors, learn about their research interests. It was a, it was an eye-opener for me to learn about the varied research interests that people have and varied, uh, you know, the, the, the professors, that the work that they've been doing, an amazing work that they're doing in research. That helped me to actually crystallize my thoughts on my in a doctoral degree and that actually helped me to open the door for a doctoral degree so i i really don't regret for taking that step in going and getting an under, additional undergraduate degree at york university because that opened the way for me to pursue my doctoral degree that one motivated me number two to help me to understand a lot of research that goes on with the faculty the rich resource that the faculty at the school of nursing have so it was really really helpful for me mm. And what I'm hearing in that in that story for our guests is a way to process some of the struggles that come with higher education and turning them into an opportunity. And that really helps with longevity and grit, we would say, for grad studies. All right. We, some people would like to know if any of you have ever been a TA. And I think, Alex, you have been. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, the overall time commitment to teaching each week and sort of what was the experience been like as a TA teaching? Okay, thank you for this question. So, uh, actually, it's currently my second year as a teaching assistant. And uh, as a teaching assistant, uh, I'm responsible for facilitating tutorials for around uh, 50 students, 5 0. Uh, this includes uh, conducting tutorial sessions, attending uh, lectures, holding office hours uh, for student consultation, and dedicating time to preparation and grading assignments. Uh, the TA also uh, participates in meetings and uh, collaborates with the core supervisor to ensure the effective course delivery. Uh, overall, the total number of hours assigned to me for the TA position uh, is 135 hours per term. You can calculate uh, how this works for each week, but um, have in mind that uh, TAs play uh, a crucial role uh, in supporting the course and uh, and the course structure, of course, and uh, they enhance the, the learning experience for the students. So for me, teaching is rewarding and uh, it's an excellent opportunity uh, to engage with the students, uh, to uh, study and learn new things uh, as, as, uh, as a student and a, a TA myself. And uh, while sometimes uh, those new things are unrelated, unrelated to my field, they are always uh, very stimulating and they can always give me, uh, provide me with very interesting new ideas. And also don't don't forget that it's a great opportunity for me to practice my, my English. Ah, yeah. And so uh, having the opportunity to be a TA is provided to doctoral students. There's additional remuneration that can occur, which is great, free money, not really free, but you're doing very important work. But, you know, they say the best way to learn something is to teach it. And so a lot of TAs get assigned in an area not their own, and they find that they've grown and expanded. Um, and you get more confident, too, because gra undergrads are coming to you and sort of like, ah, what do I say? And you find your footing. Awesome. Um, why don't we talk about the kinds of scholarship opportunities that have existed for you? Ramesh, I want to start with you if you have something to say about that. Thank you, Cheryl. York University offers a great number of resources for funding, and the resources for funding could be classified as internal funding opportunities and external funding opportunities. External funding opportunities primarily is from the Tri-Council, the SHRC and CIHR, depending on which specialization you are in. There's a lot of, uh, they're very competitive. You need to prepare, you need to consult with your supervisor at the beginning and make sure your proposal is uh, up to the, the mark, and then you'll be able to get that. And then if you get uh, SSHRC or a tri-council funding and, and, and it can be added to your resume. That's supposed to be kind of meritorious kind of funding and it's a good addition to your resume. That's number one. Number two, there are a number of internal funding opportunities that are available and, the, and these resources are all listed uh, on, on the FGS website and there are the, 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 the staff members who are working, they're very, very helpful. You can always go in and you know ask for help and they will help you to actually prepare your application. Not, not literally in the sense, they will tell you the technical uh, uh, requirements for, that are needed for the application and then they will there are also a number of bursaries right people coming from uh, the other country especially people like me who came in uh, as as a as an immigrant and i i always depended on these resources for 
funding and, and, and until I found a, a permanent kind of a job. So these resources are very helpful in addition to what Alex had mentioned, uh, you know, the opportunities for being a TA or a research assistant or a marker grader, that actually helps us to get kind of uh, uh, funding that is kind of sustainable, you know, you, you get it throughout the term and you'll also get uh, healthcare benefits, which is also an additional uh, re important resource to consider, right? So, and, and I think the whole uh, uh, notion of uh, uh, every student will be supported in terms of finances is, is the kind of motto with which FGS operates at York University. You can always reach out to people and there are ways by which they can always help you. Thank Alex, you. how about you? Thank you, Ramesh. Experiences with scholarships, something you'd like to share with our guests? So uh, Ramesh gave us a, a great, the great, uh, uh, the great picture, um, the greater picture. Uh, I will try to be more specific about my own experience, which perfectly uh, encapsulates what, uh, what Ramesh just said. So uh, I have been honored uh, with the Hellenic Heritage Foundation uh, International Graduate Fellowship in Modern Week History. So uh, this, uh, for this scholar, the recipient, uh, scholarship, excuse me, the recipient must meet uh, program requirements, be fluent uh, both in written and oral English, of course, and Greek, and they demonstrate financial need. Sometimes if there are no uh, eligible international applicants, uh, students from Canada can be considered. Uh, also, as an international student, one can apply for the Ontario uh, Graduate Scholarship, the OGS. Uh, its value is around $5,000 per term, uh, up to $15,000 over three terms. And the uh, applications are open in October, and uh, the results are uh, announced in late summer for of the following year. Um, so uh, if accepted, you will receive the scholarship one year after your application. Uh, while it's uh, my first application was declined, my first OGS application was declined, you have the opportunity to apply again and again. Uh, so I await the outcome of my second application, which will be announced in August. So yeah, there are internal funding. There is internal mm -hmm. funding and external funding. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I know Anessa has placed a link in the chat for our guests. I would say that dig and look on the different websites at York of all the opportunities once you're here, when you're coming in. There's so many, and and I, I oversee some of these conversations about awards, and sometimes some don't even get applied for. So, um, you know, just keep trying and and look for those. Awesome. Thank if you. If you don't mind, can I just add one thing? Yeah. yeah. So one of the other things is, uh, as Alex mentioned, Ontario Graduate Scholarship is available for all the graduate students. You can even apply before you can even be uh, admitted to the program. Yes. So there are, you know, even before you come into York University, you can apply. So these resources are very important. So thanks, Anissa, for posting that link. Yeah, perfect in there. That's awesome. Um, okay, let's go to this question. And this is a fun, I think it's a funny question and such a valuable question. And it's, Asking when you're off doing your research, however that looks, how independent is the research of students? Do you work together with other students or do you work with a supervisor or are you all on your own? Um, let's start with Ariella. The research is independent, but you're also never alone and you also have a lot of support. For example, I had three supervisors in my program, one that was for each of the disciplines, and I would meet with each one independently. I would meet with them sometimes all together for group discussions. And my program director also put together a course with everybody else in my program. So we would meet, we would talk about any issues, they would give us some advice. And there was also a peer group that my one of my supervisors, which was Dr. Van Dalen Smith, um, put together with all of the students that she was supervising at the time. So we would meet over Zoom and we would kind of do peer mentoring. So if someone was doing well in something, they would tell the other students in the group how it had been going. If someone had a question, they could bring it up and get answers and get support. And sometimes we would do breakout rooms where we discussed independent, we got advice from each other. So in that way, we didn't feel like we were just on our own, mm -hmm. especially since a lot of the time that I was at York doing my master's degree, it was on Zoom or it was online. So it didn't feel as isolating everybody in their own houses because we had all of those different ways that we could connect to people and we could get support from people. 
Mm, that was during the pandemic. I wondered if you, just before I go to you, Alex, I wonder if you can speak a little bit of when you're in the field. So when, when students are off in the field and they're doing their field research, whatever that looks like, what kind of supports could our guests anticipate receiving from their supervisors? And that's for you, Ariella. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Because I just, the chat popped up at the same time. Yeah. What I'm asking is um, when you're out in the field doing your research, what kind of supports could our guests anticipate that they would receive from supervisors? Mm -hmm. So out doing interviews, okay. looking in the archives. Yeah. So definitely um, I received support from my supervisors about how to craft questions and how to craft thoughtful questions and also how to conduct myself when I was running an interview or when I was running a focus group, different tips that I could use such as trying to talk less than the participants. That was, that was a big one. And that's really important to learn. I shouldn't be the one who is running. I'm running, but I'm facilitating. I'm supposed to be listening. So also debriefing after the fact. I could I came to my supervisors with questions um, when I'll talk later about coding, but when I had to transcribe the data and when I had to pull information from the data, that was times that I really learned leaned on my supervisors and I got advice from their experience, especially since all three of them have experience in the thing that I was researching with. So they sent me articles that they thought would be helpful. They told me about their own experiences doing research on these topics. And I was able to really benefit, not just, I didn't only have to get my own experience, I can also learn from them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And sorry for that added question, right? I was Thank thinking you. about when you're in the field. Yeah. Alex, how about you? Let's talk about this from your perspective. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that the level of independence in the research uh, can vary depending on uh, the program and the nature of the research. So uh, in my case, uh, my research is in close collaboration with my supervisor because currently I am uh, also a research assistant at uh, York University's Hellenic Heritage Foundation Greek Canadian Archives, mm -hmm. funded under the 2021 SARC partnership grant. So my responsibilities include data collection, uh, conducting interviews, just as Ariella, uh, specifically focusing on the experiences, of course, of Greek migrants in Canada. So given the collaborative nature of uh, our project, teamwork is essential. Uh, uh, while, I, while I do maintain a level, level of uh, independence uh, in my task, uh, such as uh, collecting, uh, asking the particular questions that uh, are interest, of interest to me mm -hmm. and analyzing those uh, uh, results I get, um, I also rely on the guidance of my supervisor and, of course, the suggestions of uh, my fellow uh, team members. So, yeah, it depends. It depends. Mm. Yeah, that's an important nuance there. I want to answer the questions in the chat. And the question is, how can prospective undergrad students develop the research skills they need for grad studies, specifically in the different research methodologies? Well, listen. You don't have to come in knowing how to be a researcher. You should learn how to be a researcher in your grad program. And so there should be a research seminar. There should be research courses uh, or course, minimally a course, where you're going to learn about methodologies. And then it's sort of an apprentice sort of approach to doing research you're, um, where you, I think I want to do this topic. And I think these are the questions I want to ask. What do you think, committee? And they talk to you and they help massage it. How about this method? What do you think, committee? And you sort of have these educative discussions with your committee and come out with a stronger approach to the research you want to do. And I know Ariel is going to talk about data analysis in a little while. So all to say, you don't have to come in knowing how to do be a researcher, okay? You're going to learn that in grad studies. Uh, Ramesh, question for you. How do you feel that you developed over the course of your grad degrees at York? Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. And I, when I look back and reflect on how I was during my year one of uh, the doctoral studies and how am I now, I kind of feel I was a different person. I changed a lot. And I and, and I am sorry to bring in again Cheryl's name here. <laughs> Cheryl yeah. was our first doctoral seminar uh, professor who taught us, who, who taught us to be open-minded who taught us to be, you know, 
be open to all the perspectives in life. So that's one of the first things that you need to learn as a researcher. I was so much into quantitative kind of methodology, but when I came in and I realized that there are a number of worldviews, and especially for my profession like nursing, where you need to have the science and the art combined together. And, and it makes really a good sense to look at different methodologies. So as a researcher, understanding different perspectives, asking critical questions, though we may not have answers uh, ready, but questioning was important. And and uh, and that was encouraged throughout the program. So when I came out as a researcher, I, I, I felt like I had a lot more questions than answers. And I thought I could continue to ask these questions in my journey as, as uh, uh, an academician as well. And then as an academician, as Alex said, this, this platform gave us a lot of opportunities to be a teaching assistant. So I was participating in actually delivering lectures, grading papers, which, which I had done in other places, but then this, is, this was in Canadian context, which was very important for me to learn the nuances of being an academician. So that was another opportunity during the, the doctoral degree. And then as a professional, what can I do to make sure that my my contribution is there to 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 kind of uh, you know once you complete your doctoral degree you become a person a source for knowledge a person who generate knowledge to to actually improve the profession right that kind of a question and then you ask questions in such a way that you not only are the member who's del who's actually creating those knowledge but you you become a, a part of a team that actually looks for answers. So it's not you as an individual, it's a team that looks for answers and that kind of a, a change. And I feel I'm completely a different person now as an overall, as an individual. And, and, and Cheryl often used to say, you know, imposter syndrome catches you during the studies and you have, you have multiple challenges that come along the way because you have life happening throughout the period that you're there and you learn to tackle. And, and, and I'm grateful to all the teachers, all to my supervisor, my my doctoral committee for being so understanding, you know, whenever I had issues. So thank you. Yeah, it's a very large question. How do you quickly answer such a question of how do you how do you feel you developed over grad studies? What what I hear in that is being open and being open to changing, to learning, but also maybe unlearning some things. And um, yeah, that can be very cool. It kind of leads us to the next question. And this is going to be for you, Ramesh, again, and then I'll go to Ariel after. And that is, was there a difference between what you thought grad studies would be like and your actual experience? Yes, that's again uh, a, a question which can be answered with a yes, or yes and no. So uh, I had done my uh, master's degree elsewhere, so I knew how would it be uh, to be a grad student? So a little bit, but then this is, this experience was slightly different because I'm doing it in a different country where um, you know the education system is slightly different. But the 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 significant difference would be that you decide as a student, as a graduate student, you decide on the focus of research. So when I actually presented my research topic uh, the first time. Uh, the committee said, uh, Ramesh, it'll take about seven to 10 years. So that's the help that uh, Cheryl was telling. You know, they, the committee will massage it. The committee will help you to crystallize the, the, uh, the topic. So that's the kind of help that I was thinking maybe I should go ready with the topic and then I should go ahead and do the study on that particular topic. No, you don't have to. You come with a broader idea. You talk to the committee. That's why the experts are there. They will actually help you to crystallize, and then uh, 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 and then you can focus on the topic. And yet, you can do a study that is doable within the time frame that you have. So th that kind of a difference. So yes, mm -hmm. I learned there was there were differences, but no, yes, I had I'd known this uh, earlier as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thank you, and Ariella in a master's degree. So it's your first sort of. Uh, I hope not your last first uh, go at grad studies, um, was there a difference between what you thought it would be like and what it was like? Like Ramesh, I started at the beginning with several topics and my supervisor helped me to distill them and distill them until I got to what I actually wanted to focus on because it was too much. I, I thought that research would be more talking to people and learning from people, but I, the thing that I didn't expect was how much preparation it actually would take 
in order to get to that point of me sitting across from someone and having a conversation. Because in my undergrad, I did some research for some courses. It involved maybe a small ethics clearance and then a conversation. But this was more reading than I could have possibly thought I would be doing to prepare, filling out ethics review, filling it out again if you did it wrong, recruiting the participants. And then there was a very small window over the course of the two years that I actually was speaking to participants. And after that, I was transcribing what I had heard. I was coding. I took a research methods course so that I could become better at coding. And I also went to a seminar so that I could be better at coding. And it was a thesis based master's degree that I was doing. So then I was spending many months writing up my findings. Mm. So that's the, that's the thing that stands out for me as something that I didn't expect is how much preparation mm. it would take to do the research. Yeah. And that comes from a real appreciation and respect of the necessary rigor in research so that our participants aren't harmed and that our participants probably benefit from ha spending time with you uh, as scholars. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Ariel, I'm going to stick with you. Was there a moment when something clicked for you uh, and your perspective maybe sharpened? There's a few things. So first of all, um, when I had more confidence in myself as I was going on with the program and I realized that I had something unique that I can contribute and I can also bring back from the university to my community and also that I could bring that from a degree to a career because I've always loved teaching and this is a different way that I can make a difference in the field of education. The second thing is that People, when I would talk about my studies, people started telling me their stories. And the field of gender and education is just so applicable to so many people and so many different cultures and so many different religions. So what's happening with Jewish girls, like identity or struggles with faith, maybe trying to be seen as a good girl or trying to rebel and not be seen as a good girl. It's happening with Jewish girls, but it's happening everywhere, not just with Jewish girls. And finally, when I realized that the story that I was telling and the research that I was doing is also my story, that's what really brought everything home because I grew up in the community that I was researching with and I grew up with the population that I was studying. Mm -hmm. So that really clarified things for me when I was able to bring myself to my research, not try and leave myself behind, but add myself and my voice to what I was writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, fantastic. I'd like to stick with that and ask all of you, but I'm I, I'm being told we're halfway. So we're going to keep going along, if that's all right with everybody. Um, okay, Alex, I think I'm going to start with you for this next question. So knowing what you know now, your year two in a doctoral program, and if you could speak to your former self as you were just entering this doctorate, what would you tell that self to do the same or differently or even to be aware of? Big question. Well, thank you for that one. Uh, so we have to remember that grad school is a really long term, right? Um, so I would tell my former self that uh, I have to be prepared to embrace uh, the emerging challenges. Uh, to understand that pursuing uh, advanced studies will come with its own uh, obstacles and uh, to perceive these obstacles as opportunities for growth mm -hmm. and uh, and learning, right? Uh, so uh, we have to embrace these challenges rather than sigh away from them. Also, uh, we have to remember to take care of, our, of ourselves, uh, prioritize uh, self-care and well-being because academia is is demanding. Well, uh, I would I would tell myself to take breaks and uh, most importantly share my experiences with uh, peers who, while I don't know it, most of the times uh, face the same challenges as I do. And finally, of course, you have to celebrate your accomplishments, whether they are big or small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, milestones. I have a I have a student right now that. As she finishes each chapter, she buys herself yarn. And uh, 
So that's kind of fun. Ariella, how about you? How would you answer this question in terms of knowing what you now know? What would you tell your former self? I would tell myself to have a thick skin when I get feedback because all the people that are giving me feedback are doing it for my benefit and they're doing it because they're trying to help me. I would also tell myself to write every day and also to take breaks, which is I'm just stealing advice from what Cheryl has told me as my supervisor. And I also would say to take advice from people who were in my situation. So not to feel weird about messaging someone and saying, oh, you're in your second year. Can we go out for coffee and can I ask you some questions? Um, if there is a scholar who I've been reading about and that scholar quotes somebody else, read about that person, read what those people read and learn from other people who have been in my situation and have been researching the same kind of thing as me. Hmm. Nice. Okay. Um, Ramesh, I wanted to ask you this question and that is, when did you start to think about how you might use or translate your degree into a career? Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I think all of us who start with our graduate studies have always had the goal in our minds, right? I, I, I was a teacher back home and I wanted to also always get back to teaching. I wanted to become an academician. Uh, and and I, I thought the best way to uh, get back to academia is by pursuing the terminal degree, which is the doctoral degree in nursing. And then uh, that paves the way to get into this academic, academic, uh, academician positions. Now, when I completed my doctoral degree, somebody told me, world is your oyster. In the process of you know, getting the doctoral degree, the goal remains the same. You, you, I want to get back to academia, become an academician, but then there are other things that I could do as well yes. in that process, right? In, 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 in the process, I've learned so many things, right? I could contribute to the profession in many different ways. I could be a researcher. I could be a clinician. I could be, uh, uh, you know, helping with a small project come up, which, which will actually make an impact for people. So keep your doors open. So it's not fixed on, although you will start, you know, with with an objective in your mind, but but then the the doctoral degree or your graduate degree actually opens a lot more doors that than you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we and F FGS really wants our doctoral students and people like you that are thinking about choosing grad York, and we hope you will to realize that it's not only to be a a professor. There's lots of ways. In fact, a lot of people are coming into grad school now to go back into their discipline, go back into industry or policy development to, to make a diff in that way. Um, Ariella, how would you respond to that? How When did you start to think about how you might use or translate your degree experience into a career or into a career change? So I was um, teaching during the pandemic and the height of the pandemic when everything was closed and everybody was quarantining and I was teaching on Zoom. And because I've always been passionate about education, I, I was started to think about different ways that I could support my students. And I knew that students, especially now in these times, they needed more and they needed different sorts of supports. And I especially wanted to take a rights-based approach to education. So I knew that in order to achieve that, despite the fact that I did have a degree in education, I needed to go back to school and I needed to increase my knowledge. I needed to study further. So the whole time when I was doing the degree as well, I was thinking, how can I try, what's my next step? Mm -hmm. How can I translate this into a career? And I definitely, I know this somewhat, this a little bit relates to the next question, but um I, I definitely wouldn't have been hired for the job that I have now, which is working as a education and community coordinator at a Jewish day school in Toronto. I wouldn't have been hired without the experience that I brought to the table from doing this degree. Mm -hmm. I will say too, to, to everybody listening and to you, Alex, since you're a current student, there is something called an individualized development plan. And that is a document, and I believe Ramesh and Ariella both did it, where you begin to think about your goals. Even though you're like, oh, I'm in coursework, my goals. Yes, your goals. And where are you strong? And where do you have growth areas in order to get to that goal? And that can change too. I want to be a curricular consultant. Okay, how are we going to get you in that direction? I want to be a policy implementer. How can we get you in that direction? So 
Um, I'll ask my moderator, if you can, to find the link to the individualized development plan. It doesn't have to be right away. And maybe we can pop that in the chat. Um, and it, it just is that a development plan for my individual self, how I want to take this degree. So um, I'm going to start with Ramesh on this, that you've experienced the reality of post-graduation transition into a career which using many, maybe all of your skills and knowledge that you hone during the degree. So what's the reality like now? And poor Ramesh, you know, I think you graduated Tuesday, hired Wednesday into a leadership role Thursday, but why don't you talk about how that transition's been? Thank you. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the opportunities that have been given to me. I'm so privileged to have been, uh, you know, chosen for those leadership uh, roles as well. Thank you. Yes, it was kind of like that. So all of the skills that I learned during the doctoral degree to be an academician, to be a leader, to be a professional, to be a researcher, to be asking questions, all of it are needed in you know to to perform well in your current role as an academician in addition you would also need uh, other uh, uh, you know uh, uh, skills in terms of relating with people working as, as a team and and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in, in in your doctoral study you probably are doing a research that you are alone and you're only uh, relating it with or in uh, or interacting with the supervisor and the research team but then when you are becoming an academician when you are in your career then there are a lot more interactions that happens you interact with the students you interact with the colleagues you interact with the leadership team so so much uh, is is to be learned uh, uh, for the successful uh, you know functioning as an academician as well Thank you for that. Yeah, Ariel, I want to hear your thought about this. So you've experienced the reality of graduated and moved into a career uh, where maybe you brought some of your skills, your content knowledge. So what's this reality like for you now? We all we know how difficult it is to find a job, especially nowadays. And I feel very fortunate. I put in my application, I said, this is what my research was in, this is what my experience is in, my undergrad, my master's, and all of a sudden, they were listening, and they were interested, because I was bringing something different than other applicants, and I was also bringing something different than what the people already working there had. It was a, a new and a fresh skill set. So I'm able to now work on some aspects of development, some aspects of curriculum. I'm really just starting out. This is my first year. And I'm also, I've also gotten back into teaching recently. And some of my colleagues were surprised. They said, wait, you're, you're a teacher. Also, they didn't, they didn't know that because I'm in a different role. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about you getting that position and, um, there was a question in the chat about how do we even get a reference? Like, that's so uncomfortable to ask that reference for that reference. You know, the, this is why you want to have good relationship with your supervisor and your supervisory committee, because they would know best your skill base and um, they, they would be who you would hit up, if you will, to be asking for a reference. But I, I want to go to Alex because I'm in, really intrigued to hear your response to this. What What are some of the good surprises that you encountered? Um, and things you wouldn't have known or thought of while you were a student. I'll start with Alex first, and then I'll go to Ramesh. Yeah, thank you for this question. So uh, one of the surprises I, I encountered was discovering, engaging, and study, engaging with and starting a, a vibrant community that I didn't even know that existed. Uh, so uh, growing up in a family with uh, no history of migration and no relatives abroad, I never anticipated the rich and diverse Greek community that I could find here in, in Toronto. Uh, living in a multicultural city uh, like Toronto with uh, vibrant communities opened up a whole new world of connections and experiences for me. Uh, additionally, I found that being a graduate student was not actually not only intellectually uh, stimulating, but actually really fun and enjoyable. And this is because uh, you have the freedom to research topics that you are passionate about and without other distractions or responsibilities, right? So it was something that I didn't realize uh, while I was an undergraduate student. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how about you, Ramesh? Some good surprises that you would have that you've encountered. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And when I was a student, I always look for answers. I can go to Cheryl, I can go to my supervisor, Dr. Singh, ask for uh, those answers. And, and I'll just sit quietly because they will be providing me with the answers or they will at least guide me to where to find the answers. But now I'm in a position of providing their answers. People look up to you when you finish your doctoral degree. You are in such a responsible position where you need to be able to actually it's not that you have answers to all the questions. No, it's just at least people are looking forward to your contribution. So you have to be prepared to take that leadership role. And by 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 virtue of finishing your doctoral degree, you are you know bestowed with that kind of a responsibility. So you can't run away from it. You have to uh, uh, grow up to that particular responsibility. So that's something that I learned. Yeah, that was a surprise. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the question about how did you develop and any of the students that I've had the privilege to stand beside, I see them get stronger in themselves, more confident in themselves, that they eventually see in themselves what I could see from day one. And um, I think that's one of the more beautiful pieces of going through grad school is, yeah, you need grit and determination for sure, uh, but you grow and you begin to realize it's not about me, that I'm a scholar for the public good. I'm trying to make a difference for the public good. Um, if that attracts you, our guests, who are thinking about choosing you, do you want to have an impact on the public good? And grad school is a great way to think about that. Um, let's talk about challenges. What has been the biggest challenge, either during your degree or in creating a career? Ariella, I'll start with you. Challenges. I'll talk about during my degree. Um, firstly, knowing when to stop because I was very interested in so many different aspects of my topic that it was hard at first to focus it and to distill it down to something that was workable in the span of two years. Yeah. And the other thing that was difficult for me is that every person's thesis is unique to them, but there are also rules and standards about how they need to be and how they need to look and what they need to include. So that I was doing a lot of a lot of reading, a lot of research about how to write a findings chapter, an introductory chapter. I was looking at a lot of examples that other people had sent me, and I was getting advice from my supervisors. But then I would realize that I was missing a key component, and then I would have to start again. I must have written each chapter at minimum three or four times. So it was absolutely worth it in the end. But while I was in those months of writing and rewriting, it, I found that very challenging. Yeah. And just for, to the horror of people listening to what she had to rewrite it a few times, uh, Ariella <laughs> uh, defended her thesis and was nominated for a thesis prize. And so I think I, I just want people to know that it pays off to be uh, so careful. Alex, how about you? Biggest challenge during your degree? So I'm trying to be short, this one. Uh, um, studying uh, studying uh, in grad school might seem overwhelming. Uh, I think my biggest challenge uh, was time management. Uh, so balancing academic demands is not a very easy task. Uh, at the same time, there are really stressful uh, periods, particularly the comprehensive exams for PhD students, uh, which exacerbate this challenge. Mm. And also, at the same time, for me, as an uh, international student, uh, there were times that I felt homesick. Yeah. Uh, homesickness, homesickness emerged and um, making it difficult to uh, mm. concentrate on your own goals. But of course, there you have people there, you have people here uh, able to uh, help you. And of course, the university provides uh, resources for for students to uh, cope with these feelings, both of uh, overwhelmness and uh, homesickness. Yeah, it's similar to what I was going to ask you about being an international student, both you and Ramesh, like, were there resources and services provided at York for, for folks that are newcomers to Canada? Can you say a little bit more about that, Alex? Yeah, I was I was planning to talk about that in the uh, following our discussion, but uh, I think that York International gave me the most, uh, uh, the, the, great, the, be the best idea of how university works and where I can go. Yeah. Uh, sessions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, during these orientation sessions, you can, you can um, try to find and you can, you are, introduced to the uh, 
excuse me, uh, the uh, resources available. Mm -hmm. uh, mental uh, mental consultation, for example, uh, or other resources and clubs, uh, student clubs, etc. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. That not that grad school creates emotional distress. It's just that mental health is so important that the faculty of grad studies has grad wellness supports for grad students specifically. Um, and so we can put that link in the chat as well if we have the have that ready in the next five or so minutes. Um, we have that opportunity as well. But Ramesh, I wanted to hear from you. Oh, it's already there. Thank you. Um, Ramesh, if I can just hear from you about your experience as an international student. Thank you, Cheryl. I, just to piggyback on what Alex said, there are a number of student clubs. There are ethnic student clubs. So if you're coming from a particular background, you can find people from the same culture having a club where you can go and relate to. They speak the same language. They, they tell you the challenges that they've faced and then how mm -hmm. did they overcome? So this is one way of you know getting helped with the, with the, with the challenges that you face as an international student. And it is it is you 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 never feel that you've learned everything about the culture of canada it it takes a while for you to get to know and get uh, you know to internalize the cultural nuances i still go to tim hortons ask for a cup of coffee they ask me how do you take it i tell them i take it in a cup and drink it i don't tell them the double double or triple triple so <laughs> so I, that's a that's a learning that uh, that's too cute yeah, yeah thank you yeah i'm thinking about all the ways international students benefit york and just to be selfish, like we have fantastic Indian food now at York. We have fantastic Greek food now at York. We have a kosher restaurant here at York. Um, and so we try to keep with our demographic. But let's let's close this time with hearing from the three of you. And I'll, I'll start with Ariella first. Why choose York University for grad school? For me, it came down to the fact that it has very diverse programs and you're able to do things in combination, whatever you're interested, you're able to find something there. Um, I would also, if anyone is interested in several topics in combination, I would personally highly recommend the interdisciplinary studies program. Also because there is a lot of support in graduate studies. You could find a community which you might not expect because the school is gigantic, but there were meetups that I went to. We did art nights and we did Zooms and we I went to two separate writing groups where we would keep each other accountable and we'd be writing independently while in the same space or while in the same chat or Zoom online, um, some co-working. So there were just many opportunities that I was able to get at York that I didn't feel I'd be able to get at a different institution. Thank you. Uh, Rabesh, how about you? Why choose York University for grad school? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. York University, social justice is embedded in the lives of everyone at York University. If you feel that you want to make a significant contribution in the lives of people, irrespective of your profession, irrespective of your uh, specialty that you're working in, York is the place because... At York University, every student matters. Thank you. Thank you. And Alex, what would you say to that question? So uh, choosing York University for me was a, a natural decision. It came naturally. And uh, after visiting the university in 2019 uh, as an exchange uh, student, uh, I was immediately charmed by its welcoming atmosphere, uh, the really friendly professors, helpful staff, and uh, a strong sense of community as uh, have already heard. Um, so deciding to study migration made Toronto the best choice for mm -hmm. me. And of course, York University has the chair of uh, modern Greek studies, um, which is one of the most developed uh, chairs of modern Greek studies in, in North America. Mm -hmm. uh, being the third uh, largest university in, in Canada, York provides access to numerous uh, resources. Uh, it provides state-of-the-art facility. And, uh, of course, there are plenty uh, of funding opportunities, uh, as we already discussed. So uh, the university actively encourages uh, um, uh, and supports research, uh, fostering an environment where scholars can make meaningful contributions. And that's not something that you can, that's something you can uh, understand from your, your very first visit to, to York. And that's something I understood back in 2019 when I came here for the first time. Yeah, thank you for that. So I want to first thank our panelists for preparing these responses, which I knew took a lot of thinking 
and you've you've been very meaningful in what you've been trying to say to us and also to our guests. You're thinking about choosing Grad York. Hopefully you've heard something today that's going to help you make that decision. We really do help you help, hope that you'll join us. And uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Grad Studies, I'd like to say thank you very much. And we'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.